it's never been easier for a director to end up in movie jail. It used to be pretty easy, but also it still is pretty easy. Some of the greatest directors, people that have won Academy Awards for the job, people whose movies are considered to be some of the greatest ever made, people that have directed classics, still find themselves running afoul of the studios. And if the money men are unhappy, they can make your life hell. In this video, I want to take a look at the directors that have been stuck in movie jail for years, some of them decades, because they had one or two movies that did not land with an audience. It doesn't matter if they made some of the greatest films ever. Eventually, they exhausted all the goodwill that they might have had and now struggle to get a project off the ground, or have decided to leave the industry entirely. Jean de Bont has had a long, long career. Before he got into directing movies, he worked for a long time as a cinematographer on movies like Cujo in 1983, Die Hard in 1988, Black Rain in 1989, The Hunt for Red October in 1990, and Basic Instinct in 1992. But I mostly mention this so I can mention 1981's Roar, which saw DeBond get scalped by a lion. His injury needed 220 stitches and DeBond called it the only movie that he literally almost lost his head on. Roar was a wild production. Just as wild is the fact that DeBond made two certified classics in an industry where it's difficult for most directors to get one. They were back to back as well and, unfortunately, serve as the high point of his directing career. The first was Speed in 1994. Made on a budget that went as high as $37 million, the movie was a home run success, making more than $350 million at the box office. It stars Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock, dealing with a bus that needs to stay above 50 miles per hour or it'll explode. It's one of those action thriller movies that also got well-deserved critical acclaim from critics and was hailed as one of the best movies of that year. The commercial story was the same for 1996's Twister, which raked in almost $496 million on its $92 million budget, a sure success. It was the second highest grossing movie of the year, and while its critical reviews weren't as good as speed, it got some well-deserved Academy Award nominations for Best Sound and Best Visual Effects. It even got a sequel a few decades later, though Twisters didn't do as well financially. And then things started going very wrong for DuPont. Part of the issue was commercial. None of the next three films that he directed, which were 1997's Speed 2, which was basically Speed, but with a boat and without Keanu Reeves, 1999's The Haunting, and 2003's Lara Croft, Tomb Raider, The Cradle of Life, were a commercial success on par with his previous two films. The Haunting and, according to DuPont, Tomb Raider made money, though Speed 2 was a catastrophic loss. But part of it was also critical. Studios want movies that make money, yes, but they also want movies that people like. The common critical consensus among DeBond's last few films was that they all sucked, and depending on who you ask, Speed 2 is either one of the worst sequels ever made, or the absolute worst sequel ever made. He was set to direct Minority Report for a while as well, but Spielberg would eventually do it himself. He also was set to make a Godzilla movie, but the studio said no to his budget before giving Roland Emmerich a bigger one. Eventually, he just couldn't get any project greenlit, which led to a de facto ban from directing. Still, DeBont has several ideas he wants to work on, and he says that he wants to do just one more film. For his sake, I hope he gets it. The guy made some real fun movies and made sure other movies looked great. Stephen Norrington was able to get around one good hit before his directing career pretty much petered out for good. Norrington got started on the special effects side with movies like Young Sherlock Holmes in 1985, Aliens in 1986, and Aliens 3 in 1992. But, like so many people that work behind the scenes, Norrington got the itch that he wanted to be behind the camera. He would get his chance on 1994's Death Machine, a sci-fi horror film that was banned in several countries thanks to its violence. As expected, the movie got praise for its special effects, but, as this was Norrington's first time as a writer and director, it's reasonable that the rest of the movie might not have been as good. Still, it was a good audition for his next film, and the only hit that Norrington ever directed, 1998's Blade. Anybody that enjoys superhero movies now needs to pause to give Blade the respect that it deserves. First, it was a rated R superhero movie, and way darker than anything that came before it. It was Marvel's first taste of success at the movies, and one could make the argument that we have Blade to thank for the explosion in superhero films that followed. It's even more impressive when you consider that the last two superhero movies before this were 1997's Batman and Robin and Steel, both from DC, and both were flops, while X-Men did not come out until 2000. Blade took the superhero movie to new heights. It was a clear commercial success, though reviews were more mixed. What Norrington should have done after Blade was the sequel, which he was offered but declined. 
Instead, he directed 2001's The Last Minute, a poorly reviewed and forgotten film. I don't think this is what he wanted to do because Norrington has, over the years, been attached to or developed nearly two dozen projects that never went anywhere, including a Ghost Rider film, a Shang-Chi film, an Akira live action film, and a Clash of the Titans film, and more. Instead, his next, and so far, last movie was 2003's The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Now, League is interesting because the movie didn't flop at the box office. With a total of $179 million on a budget of $78 million and some decent home video sales, it likely made money. Unfortunately, it was crushed by reviews and had a troubled production, with Norrington often butting heads with Sean Connery. Since League, Norrington has been attached to many projects, but for one reason or another, has been unable to see any of them through to completion. Whether or not that'll change remains to be seen. In a Medium interview I found from 2021, he said that he was working on a small indie film called The Migrant that he was supposed to finish by 2022, but we'll see how that turns out. Steven Summers' first film, 1989's Catch Me If You Can, was a flop while his second film, 1993's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, was a modest success, as was 1994's The Jungle Book. Just half a decade later, though, came the movies that would rocket Summers to the top. These were the back-to-back -back hits of 1999's The Mummy and 2001's The Mummy Returns. Ostensibly remakes of the classic Universal Monsters movies, they were like a modern-day Indiana Jones with Brendan Fraser serving as the new action icon. The first one did okay with critics, the second one less so, but neither were bad and both are massive successes that made more than $400 million each on budgets of less than $100 million. Studios were very happy, not just with the results, but with cutting Steven Summers some very big checks. Unfortunately, after lightning struck twice, it decided not to strike again. Summers had two negatively received films back to back. First, there was 2004's Van Helsing, which had Hugh Jackman in the titular role. The movie grossed just over $300 million on a budget that was as high as $170 million, more than twice what he had for The Mummy. Universal was so confident that they had another hit on their hands that they started developing the sequel even before the movie came out, but the box office total was so disappointing, they scrapped it. The story was much the same for 2009's G.I. Joe, The Rise of Cobra, which made just over $302 million on a gigantic $175 million budget. Paramount was apparently happy enough to greenlight a sequel, G.I. Joe Retaliation, but Summers was not brought back on. Instead, he directed 2013's Odd Thomas, a box office bomb that was mired in legal troubles. Since 2013, Summers has not directed another film, which is disappointing. The guy makes fun films, and both of his mummy movies are action classics. I even enjoyed Van Helsing, though I enjoyed G.I. Joe a bit less, mostly because I never really got into it. Summers is attached as director to When Worlds Collide, which is in development right now, so I hope he's able to make a comeback. That said, this movie has been in development hell since 2005, so we'll see how it goes. I mostly wanted to add Stephen King because I found it amusing that he has exactly one directorial credit, 1986's Maximum Overdrive, and he wouldn't be on this list if it didn't bomb catastrophically. Stephen King has been associated with movies probably as long as he's been an author. Dozens of his works, which includes novels, novellas, and short stories, have been adapted into films over the decades, and he's the living author with the most adaptations right now. It started with Carrie and has been going apace since. In 1986, maybe fed up with directors mangling his works, King decided that it was his time to get in the director's chair. Maximum Overdrive was a campy horror movie loosely adapted from trucks. It's about a world where a comet brings machines like ATMs, trucks, lawnmowers, and more to life, and those machines, in turn, try to deprive humans of their lives. It also has a phenomenal soundtrack from ACDC, which is probably the best part of the movie. Needless to say, it bombed, making just $7.4 million on a $9 million budget, and got clobbered by critics. Variety said that, quote, Master Manipulator Stephen King, making his directorial debut from his own script, fails to create a convincing enough environment to make the kind of nonsense he's offering here believable or fun, end quote. Why was it so bad? Well, King offers a compelling reason, quote, I was coked out of my mind, end quote. Wisely, he decided to put himself in movie jail and vowed to never make another film again. Deciding whether or not to include Francis Ford Coppola was difficult. After all, Megalopolis just came out, so one could argue that he does not deserve to be here. But, lest we forget, the only reason it came out is because Coppola himself is rich. There's no other way he would be able to spend around $140 million between production and marketing costs. Megalopolis wasn't made because people trusted in Coppola. It was made in spite of no one trusting him. 
It's telling that a significant portion of Hollywood, many of whom know Coppola and are huge fans of his films, if not friends, refused to either fund or distribute Megalopolis. Francis Ford Coppola is, of course, one of the finest filmmakers ever. He's won just about every major award there is, and 1972's The Godfather, 1974's The Godfather Part II, and 1979's Apocalypse Now will all find their way onto any list of the greatest films ever made. They were all huge critical and commercial successes, and in the case of Apocalypse Now, something that Coppola was willing to risk his own money on. But there's a reason that Coppola is on this list. It's because none of the films that he's made after 1992's Bram Stoker's Dracula have made any money. They all failed to make more than their budget or their box office was not enough to recoup the budget. That means no commercial successes in more than 30 years. Even when you take a step back and look at Coppola's career overall, many of his movies didn't make much money or any money at all. And because he self-funded them through Zoetrope, the man was constantly flirting with bankruptcy. It's perhaps the best and the worst thing about him. Coppola is an iconoclast that does not want to compromise. He wants to make movies how he sees fit. That's a valid way to make movies, but it's also dangerous. Sometimes what you make might strike the right chord at the right time, in which case you have an apocalypse now on your hands. Other times though, it'll be the wrong chord at the worst time, in which case you have Megalopolis. In both cases, he has no one to praise and no one to blame, but himself for his place in film history. He says he wants to make one more movie, and I hope that he's able to. Megalopolis would be a sour note to end a career on. David Lynch is a hell of a director. Not only has he made some of the weirdest films ever, like 1977's Eraserhead, which he filmed on and off for five years before it struck it big on the Midnight Circuit, but he also has the critically and commercially successful The Elephant Man in 1980, the now beloved Blue Velvet in 1986, and 2001's Mulholland Drive, considered one of the best movies ever made. But one commonality among David Lynch's movies, even beyond some of their divided critical reception, is that none of them ever made much money. Studios don't fund a David Lynch movie because they think it's going to be a blockbuster. They fund it because they know that they're in for a cinematic treat everyone will love or everyone will hate, but in the future will be regarded as a classic. None of his movies ever broke 40 million at the box office, and the one that came closest, 1984's Dune, was a critical and commercial flop thanks to its giant budget. Eventually, though, studios decided that they wanted a profit after all, or at least didn't want to give Lynch the budget that he felt that he needed to make a movie. In a 2017 interview, when he was asked if he had made his last movie with 2006's Inland Empire, Lynch said yes. According to him, quote, So many films were not doing well at the box office, even though they might have been great films, and the things that were doing well at the box office weren't the things that I would want to do, end quote. But later, after rumors swirled that he had quit directing due to emphysema, Lynch said, quote, I'm filled with happiness and I will never retire, end quote. Considering he wanted to make the animated movie Snoot World for Netflix, that seems to be the case. His most recent project was Twin Peaks The Return on Showtime in 2017. Whether or not he's able to get funding for another movie remains to be seen. Considering he's such a wonderfully weird filmmaker, I hope it works out for him. Ron Underwood had been trying to make it as a director for more than a decade, directing short films, children's films, and educational films, all the while looking for his big break. While it might have arrived with this second film, I'm going to say it arrived with 1990's Tremors. Sure, it made less than what Universal wanted it to make, but it did help launch the franchise and was a critical success. That's not to mention the huge commercial success it would find on home video and through syndication. But his next movie, 1991 City Slickers, put him on the map. The movie made an astounding $179 million on a $26 million budget and, like Tremors, it was a critical success. Roger Ebert called it, quote, the proverbial comedy with the heart of truth, the tear in the eye, along with the belly laugh. It's funny and it adds up to something, end quote. Alas, this was the high point of Underwood's filmic career. After trying so long and finally making it, his movies began a slow descent into hell. Each of his next four movies failed to even make their budget back. 1993's Hearts and Souls, 1994 Speechless, and 1998's Mighty Joe Young were all critical and commercial flops. That said, Mighty Joe Young is about a giant gorilla, and we don't have enough of those kinds of films, so I think that that should count for something. Unfortunately, it was his next flop, 2002's The Adventures of Pluto Nash, that all but sealed the deal for Ron Underwood. The film, which stars Eddie Murphy in a sci-fi action comedy, had a troubled production with extensive rewrites and reshoots that would push the budget to $100 million and cause it to miss its initial 2001 release date, which was delayed by a year. 
The result was a box office and critical disaster that pulled in just $7.1 million, making it one of the biggest box office bombs in movie history. It was also called one of the worst movies ever made. That said, Joe Ladon of Moving Picture Show called it an quote, undeserving victim of critical overkill, end quote, while one of the actors, Joe Pantoliano, said that quote, Ron Underwood, the director, got victimized by that because the guy is good, end quote. He seems to be right. Underwood was dealt a bad hand with the material, production, and behind-the-scenes drama. He would direct one more movie, 2005's In the Mix, which was poorly received before starting a wildly successful career as a TV director with a few TV films as well. So while he might be in movie jail, TV seems to love him. Martin Brest is, more than anything, an excellent filmmaker that hit one rough patch that literally obliterated his career. It's more depressing than anything, especially for someone who has three great films. The first was 1984's Beverly Hills Cop, the movie that introduced most of the world to Eddie Murphy. Sure, Murphy was on SNL and had already been in a couple of movies, but it was this movie that shot him to fame. The movie was a wild commercial success, taking in $234 million on a $13 million budget and getting great reviews. Not only that, but it also kickstarted a long-lasting franchise that saw the most recent edition, Axel F, go to Netflix, though Brest did not direct any of the sequels. Then, in 1988, he had Midnight Run, starring Robert De Niro and Charles Grodin. Here was another critical and commercial success that also spawned a franchise that Brest also did not return to. He apparently never wanted to do a sequel, ever, and he's managed to avoid doing that so far. Then there was 1992's Scent of a Woman, another critical and commercial success that would win Al Pacino his only Best Actor Academy Award ever. The point, though, is that Brest is an excellent director. Something that virtually every excellent director has is flops. Some can return from them, others can't. Brest could not. Meet Joe Black was the first sign of trouble. It came six years after his last feature, got mixed reviews, and likely did not make its money back. At least some of the money was also from people that bought tickets to watch the trailer for The Phantom Menace and then walked out. Keep in mind, this was pre-YouTube. Then came the apocalyptic Gigli in 2003 starring Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez at the peak of their tabloided to death relationship. The film made just 7.2 million on a 72 million dollar budget and got rammed by reviews. Roger Ebert called it one of the worst films he'd ever seen and named it as his seventh worst film of the 2000s. It was called dreadful, bizarre, clumsy, disorganized, unromantic, and people said that there was no chemistry between Affleck and Lopez. After it, Brest could not get another job. It wasn't even his fault as the production company, Revolution Studios, wrested control of the movie from Brest. In his words, quote, extensive reshooting and re-editing turned characters, scenes, story, and tone upside down into the futile attempt to make the increasing mess resemble a movie, end quote. It was no longer his movie by that point. I'm hopeful about him though. He has a movie in development called The Gospel of Jack and he's attached to direct it. I hope he's able to see it through to the end. A filmmaker like Martin Brest absolutely should not go out on a sour note. There are several more directors that I could have included but left off. That said, some directors simply don't belong on a list like this, such as Peter Weir, who directed Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World. I mostly mention him so I can mention the movie, which is a masterpiece, but also because while Weir hasn't had a movie since 2010's The Way Back, it's because he retired, not necessarily because he was sent to movie jail. Weir and several other directors believe that directing is a young man's game. Then there are people like Mike Judge. Judge directed Office Space and Idiocracy, but he's always been more active on the TV side of things with shows like Beavis and Butthead, King of the Hill, and Silicon Valley. Just as well though, the directors that did make it on this list were more or less forced out of filmmaking. Coppola was able to return because of his personal wealth, though most do not have that option as filmmaking is wildly expensive in order to get the kind of results that you might want. It's why these studios are reluctant to give a director that's had more misses than hits another chance. Some of these directors might get another shot, but most probably won't. That said, I like to remain optimistic. 